Hi, I'm Karen. I'm here with Anna and Amy. We're the, with the youth media team and we're here with Rory McKeeran, um, who delivered the keynote address at today's Lyricus Forum. So, Rory, can you tell us a bit about yourself, please? Yeah, uh, I am originally from Cavan. I live in Dublin and possibly moving to Clare. I'm married to an amazing woman who's a meditation teacher and a singer, musician. Her name is Susan. Her musician name is Susie Q. Check out her music. <laughs> uh, and I'm involved in youth community social justice work. Um, you shared a letter from a mother in, in a direct provision centre about the conditions in these centres. This mother had a sick child, but because there was no self-catering facilities in the centre, she was not able to access any food for her sick child. Do you think the people in Ireland know or care what these facilities are like? What the facilities in these centres are like? Well, first of all, for those that don't know what direct provision is, uh, it's a system that was set up uh, supposedly temporarily 18 years ago. Uh, for people who claim asylum, that's people fleeing uh, danger or persecution in their home country. So it could, for instance, be a war zone. Uh, they come to Ireland, they claim asylum under international law, they have the right to be heard, um, to gra be granted refugee status, but they're put into these what are essentially human warehouses all over Ireland, they're privately owned, commercially owned, profit-making institutions and the people are crowded into rooms, they have to share rooms and they're told exactly what time their meal times are every day and they're given roughly €19 Euro a week to live on, which in today's Ireland is quite almost impossible. So it's what I would say is an inhumane system that has been going on far too long and it has led to a lot of mental health problems and, I mean, there have been many other issues in, there have been suicides in direct provision centres and there are many other scandals, but a lot of them don't tend to get heard because the people in them are very afraid to speak out often. So yesterday um, I saw on Facebook a post that a mother in direct provision posted about her sick child being refused a slice of bread um, in the centre by the staff in the evening and... Um, I shared it because I thought people should know about it and then I read it out today at the conference because I pe think people should know about it. And I think some people do know what's going on but I feel like often we're too busy or get distracted and forget and take on other issues and then lots of people just don't know what's going on. So it's important that we educate people and then it's important that we campaign for change. Um, you remind us that despite the strides we have to made, um, we have made in Ireland, that we need to remember and empathise um, with those who are marginalised in our society. Why do we need to stand in solidarity with people like this? Um, because uh, there's an old saying, uh, by the grace of God, it could be you. You know, so we're if you're happy and healthy and safe, and today, like you don't know that maybe your turn will come tomorrow or in the future that. Um, you might need somebody's help or maybe you have a family member that is disabled or has mental illness or has fallen on tough times through addiction or alcoholism. Most people actually have someone like that in their family and if it was you or if you think about your family member, you would like to create a country and a culture that is a kind one, that is a caring one, that we look out for each other and support each other and we don't think that just because I'm all right, I'll forget about you. So we should always be looking out for each other. And you spoke about the need to re-energise and fear the, feed the fire within us. That leads us, that leads us to do the work that we do, particularly when we are st standing in solidar solidarity with others. Why do we need to, to do this, and do you have any advice on how we can do it? Yeah, so the fuel in the fire is just really your energy and your motivation and your passion. And, uh, you know, it's good to have that, but sometimes we burn out and, and, and give away too much energy, give away too much fire and we've nothing left herself and that leaves you feeling tired and sometimes you can get depressed then so you need to keep fueling it and how do you do it you do it through rest you do it through sleep you do it through taking time off social media turning off your phone um, going for walks in nature from music playing music dancing uh, meditation good food lots of water avoiding coffee um, just basically taking care of your body taking care of your mind and taking care of your soul and having good fun with people is always a good way to do it. Uh, you mentioned the challenge, challenge facing young people to find work, but you also qualified that by speaking about the need to find work with purpose. Can you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, so a lot of work, uh, well, throughout the ages, but certainly these days, uh, a lot of work is uh, what you might say, like 
feeding the machine. Uh, quite often we work for corporate entities where there could be thousands of people work in the company and we don't often see the product of our labour. So traditionally at the end of the day, the fisher, the farmer, the baker, the hairdresser, whatever, they would see what how many fish they caught or how many loaves they baked. And I think it's that's the purpose where you get to see but in today's workforce, sometimes we're working so hard all day and all week and we don't see what is the result of our work because it's feeding up into a big, giant corporate machine. Now, I'm not saying that all corporations are bad or anything like that, but I do think human beings need to feel purpose and need to feel valued and need to feel that their work is important. And that's why I think a lot of younger people in particular are interested in work that is, uh, has purpose. How important is the work undertaken by youth groups like Troiga, Scouting Ireland and Youth Work Ireland in supporting young people like us? Uh, I think it's essential that, uh, I think the, there's lots of great schools, there's lots of great teachers, but often the schooling system is about rote learning and developing your mind to fill it full of facts for exams. And whereas Faroga and Youth Work and groups like that, is all about developing you as a person and your confidence and your readiness for life and your ability to interact with people and to learn new skills. And in fact, I think schools should be more like that. And we youth work approach should be used more in schools. Um, but I do think um, they need more support and they need also to... I think the coder dojos, and there's lots of other ways, like it could be martial arts, could be youth work through music. It's There's so many different ways of doing youth work. Um, can you tell us about, a bit about the Breaking Walls, Building Walls and Breaking Walls, Ramos project, and what is, what is it about that that appeals to you? So that's a international EU Erasmus project for uh, young people from Ireland, North and South, Palestine, Israel, and Switzerland, and it's about actually building walls, physical walls in in those four countries, uh, and. Um, I think the real work that they're talking about is building walls of hope and understanding and connection between each other, but also tearing down walls of racism and division and prejudice where we sometimes think uh, other people are less than us or different than us when in reality when we spend time with each other, um, no matter what country you're from, what religion you are, what race you are, that you'll realise most people have the same things in common. They just want to have a good life, they want to be happy, they want to be kind. And that's what most people are like. And I, th I think that project really shows that very well. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.